Great. So uh, thank you again for having me. Uh, I started some time a while ago in physics, and then uh, I moved to California in 2006 to become a chief data scientist at the company there. I've been organizing meetups, and I also did some teaching at universities. So, uh, and quick little legal disclaimer. And I'm not here to talk about deep learning. And uh, I'm why 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 not? So a lot of people in the industry are talking about deep learning. They claim that deep learning is the best for anything. Uh, uh, is beating all the other machine uh, learning algorithms uh, on basically everything. Uh, it's beating humans. It's gonna uh, solve self-driving cars and uh, we'll have uh, pretty soon AI. I, I think this, a lot of this is uh, pretty much bullshit and I have a much more nuanced view on uh, uh, deep learning and machine learning. So deep learning is really good uh, if you work with images uh, or sequence data or in some environment in which you can, uh, virtual environment in which you can generate a lot of data um, and um, combined with reinforcement learning, indeed, uh, it had uh, achieved really uh, amazing results. Uh, however, I don't think uh, it's gonna solve AI. And meanwhile, we have all this uh, traditional machine learning. So uh, we've been using machine learning in businesses for uh, over 30 years. Uh, fraud detection, one of the areas in which I've been doing some work. Uh, credit scoring, marketing analytics, manufacturing, uh, telecom insurance, and many, many other problems where We've been using other algorithms than machine learning uh, for many, many years. So uh, I wanted to see how deep learning uh, is performing in some of these more traditional domains. So uh, uh, I cannot talk about what I'm doing for work or more exactly what kind of results I obtain on that kind of data, but uh, there are many business problems with structured data in which you can find public data. So I took some of those and here's the results for uh, one of them. Uh, I tried to beat random forest and gradient boosting uh, with deep learning. I talked to deep learning experts and uh, we simply couldn't uh, uh, build a neural net that uh, was beating some of this uh, other traditional algorithms that uh, we were suspecting that work best on structured data. So a little bit later, this is a talk for Tiang Chen. He's the author of XGBoost, the most popular gradient boosting uh, library, and also of MXNet, which is one of the popular deep learning libraries. So he knows both sides. And uh, he was looking at Kaggle's the year prior to his talk. And he came to the conclusion that two thirds of the competitions in Kaggle's were won by gradient boosting machines and not by deep learning. It turns out that uh, it depends on data. If the data was tabular structured data, kind of what you find in businesses, uh, then it was gradient boosting. If it was image speech uh, uh, or text, then it was uh, deep learning. So here's kind of my version of the slide that I show you at the beginning. So if you have tabular data, you most likely work in a business where data is structured, tabular, it's in some relational database, and you're trying to solve a prediction problem, then uh, probably gradient boosting will, will be deep learning. And then uh, here is another talk later on by, uh, Kaggle CEO Anthony, who is basically was saying the same. But a more honest answer would be, uh, it depends. Uh, I think it depends on a lot of factors. You should probably 
try different machine learning methods on your data or your problem and see what works best. Uh, but in first approximation, if it's structured tabular data, it would probably be random forest gradient boosting or if it's small data, then even linear models. And uh, if it's images, speech, then it would be deep learning. Uh, what about machine learning in general? Uh, unfortunately, the media makes you think that this is machine learning. I don't think this is machine learning. I think machine learning is this. Basically, you have data and uh, supervising, supervised learning is about uh, uh, fitting some function to the data in order to make predictions. Basically, machine learning is about learning this function, but it's basically mathematical fitting of functions. Uh, which can be simple functions in linear or something more complicated. Uh, and uh, I, I said in the abstract of this talk that you don't need a machine learning background uh, to get started with gradient boosting. I think you kind of need. So here are some kind of reference slides of what, what you want to learn before doing machine learning if you don't want to shoot, you in, shoot yourself in the foot. So machine learning is dangerous, just like statistics. You can, there are several pitfalls you want to avoid. Uh, and if these books are too hard, then probably you can start with Coursera. Uh, there is great machine learning courses there. So just go over them and uh, try to understand the basic concepts of machine learning. And it's all about uh, data science, which is kind of a little bit more general, which would include also this kind of exploring the data and cleaning and transforming the data before you uh, do machine learning. So let's get into gradient boosting. So gradient boosted trees, gradient boosting machines are based on trees. Most often uh, decision trees are build out of data. You probably have heard of decision trees before. Um, and uh, in each split, you will split according to some variable. And at the end, of, you will have leaves that will, will have some kind of out output prediction. So all this is learned, the splits, and the structure, and the leaves uh, are learned from the data. Once you have that, you can get started with boosting one of the first boosting algorithm was add a boost uh, and then gradient boosting uh, is something more sophisticated but the general idea of boosting is that uh, we build trees in this case sequentially and then uh, the ends tree is going to try to fix the errors that uh, all the other previous trees uh, were making and then uh, at the end, you will have some kind of linear combination of uh, these trees. So we build this, we build trees sequentially, and uh, uh, every tree is trying to fix the errors that the previous ones did. And this is done by changing the weights of the samples when learning the next decision tree. So what what libraries can you use uh, if you want to? Uh, use gradient boosting. Uh, I started a benchmark in 2015, and later in 2017, I have another repo, uh, the second one, uh, in which I looked at many implementations. And the gist of it is that uh, there are three best, uh, XGBoost, H2O, and LineGBM. And then maybe later we can also add CatBoost to it. And uh, all these are high performance, very well optimized, and they are accessible both from R and Python. So I'm gonna do very, sh uh, very soon uh, uh, demo, the demos of uh, uh, some of how to use some of these. So what about big data? Some people will tell me, but they have big data, they cannot use R or Python or uh, this kind of toys for their big data. So uh, most often you don't have big data. Uh, there are surveys that show that most people are working with data that fits in the RAM of one server. And also 
you probably have raw big data, but to do machine learning, you will refine, aggregate it. And by the time you do machine learning, that data will be much, much smaller and it will fit in the RAM of one server. So all you need is uh, just buy more RAM in your server or use the cloud. When I started the, this benchmark, the largest instance in the cloud had 250 gigabytes of RAM. Uh, now there are instances with terabytes of RAM. So uh, most likely your refined machine learning data will fit in the RAM of a single server. Uh, what about Spark? Uh, well, unfortunately, uh, Spark is completely garbage for gradient boosting. Their implementation in MLlib, it's about 100 times slower than the other ones that I'm going to talk about. So just don't waste time with MLlib's gradient boosting. So the currently the best performing libraries are XGBoost, LightGBM, H2, and CatBoost. I added CatBoost rec more recently to this benchmark. Uh, you can easily reproduce this benchmark. Uh, I have a Docker file, so you can just run the whole thing. And the gist is that on this data, if you have a CPU, then LightGBM is uh, the fastest, especially on larger data sets. Uh, if we look at GPU implementations, then uh, and you have a GPU, then XGBoost GPU implementation is the fastest. Uh, however, if you want to use machine learning in production, I really like H2O because it's very easy to deploy a RESTful API a predictive service with literally only these lines of code or uh, what you type on the command line. So this is all you need. I will send the slides out uh, after the talk. So don't worry about taking pictures of this or anything. Uh, here is some kind of overview of comparison between some of these libraries. Uh, I think that the most honest answer is it depends and you really, it depends on your problem and data, but kind of like the gist would be that uh, if you don't have a GPU and you want to train fast, then use like GPM. If you have a GPU, use XGBoost. Uh, if you want to deploy into production, use H2O. Uh, and I think people figure out that these are the best libraries. I did a, a survey, uh, uh, I think a year or a year and a half ago. So these are the three top ones. And then not many people are using Spark MLlib. And uh, this is one that I did a couple of weeks ago. Uh, and it shows kind of the same. So the most used HGBoost, like GBM, H2, and now uh, CatBoost. CatBoost is kind of the newest. So let's get into the demo. All the demo code is in this GitHub repo. Uh, so you can check it out after the talk. Um, and I also have here slides. Uh, that will be screenshots from a demo. I gave this talk in February in Los Angeles at the meetup. That was an in-person before COVID. And uh, I just put the screenshots in the slides because there was no recording, but uh, we'll do demo, demo. This is recorded, so there is no much uh, reason for the slides. I just need to switch to. So we 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 do first uh, in R and then in Python. Uh, I'm not sure, Zoltan. Maybe you can give me a feedback. Is this font big enough, or should I make it bigger? I think that's good. Uh, okay. Um, so uh, let's run it in R. Uh, it's very easy to install. XGBoost is on CRAN, H2O is on CRAN. For H2O, you need Java. Uh, LightGBM, uh, they tried to get it on CRAN. It was there for a few days and they kicked it out. So 
look at my GitHub repo, uh, GBM intro, how to install live GBM. It's not very complicated either. Uh, some of that, these have issues on Windows and some on, on Macs. On Linux is, is straightforward installing any of these. Uh, the issues might be like, for example, multi-threading might not work. So you just have to try. Okay, so uh, we'll load some data. So this is a prediction problem, the same airline data set. Uh, you have some input and then you need to predict if the uh, flight will be delayed or not. So uh, for XGBoost, you would need to do one hot encoding. And uh, I would recommend that you use uh, sparse matrices. It's going to be 10 plus times faster and also it's going to uh, use less uh, memory. So in R, you have uh, this uh, sparse model matrix from the matrix package that can do it. And then uh, uh, after one hot encoding, it looks like this. So the dot shows that those are zeros, but they are not stored, right? This is like a sparse matrix uh, way of storage. So to use uh, your data in uh, XGBoost, you would need to build uh, this D matrix. This is like a data structure that's optimized for gradient boosting learning. And you just provide the input and the output. And then you can train your uh, GVM. Uh, it's very simple. So you provide the data. Uh, this is uh, like binary classification. We are going to run, uh, uh, we're going to learn 100 trees, right? So I was saying that gradient boosting is about building trees. We're going to build 100 trees and uh, we're going to stop. And the maximum depth of trees is, uh, I choose it to be 10. and. Uh, there is a learning rate of zero one. So these are some of the parameters that uh, uh, gradient boosting that are called hyperparameters. So you have to choose these, or you can fiddle these and build many models and see which one works best. So if I run this, this is 100,000 records. Uh, it's running on my laptop, and it finished training in uh, four seconds. We can look into this models, a uh, little bit of description, and then uh, we can start making predictions on new data. So basically, I didn't maybe uh, didn't explain it in enough details, but the data is we split it in train and test, and then we train uh, on the training data here. So this is training of the model, very, very simple. It's basically one line or two lines of code. And then we have a model, and then we can make a prediction, which is also one line of code. So here's the uh, output, the input, and then uh, the output is stored in this variable. So basically, that's all you need to do. It's uh, you see this kind of data managing the one hot encoding that you need to do with XGBoost is uh, takes a little bit of code, but otherwise is basically read your data, do this data prep, and then the machine learning part is just uh, one line of code, uh, train the model, and then one line of code, uh, do the predictions, and you are done. And then uh, um, we can make like a confusion matrix here. It would show uh, on the test data uh, which were uh, the which flies were delayed, yes or no, and which ones we predicted, predicted yes or no. So you would see that uh, the ones that weren't delayed and we predicted correctly, uh, 
uh, are here, the ones that were delayed and predicted correctly are here, and then these are the kind of the errors. Uh, in classification, we usually you we look at the ROC curve, which would uh, uh, show you the um, trade-off between false positive and false negatives for various thresholds, and then we would calculate the area under this curve, um, which is called the AUC, and uh, this is 0 0.73. So one. If I had a perfect predictor of the future, then the AUC would be one. Uh, like the Lamy's pure random predictor would have the AUC 0, 05. So the AUC is usually between 0, 05 and one. The closer to one, the better. And then we can have this confusion matrix for different thresholds. And we can also see the how well the um, model separates the uh, the delayed slide in the test set, like yes, no. So you would see that the scores have this distribution. It it could be better. So one thing that we would do in a real life application, we would start playing with the hyperparameters. You can choose different depths for the trees. You can choose different learning rate. This is how you combine the next tree with all the previous ones. You can choose uh, how many trees uh, you are uh, building. All right, let's get now to Python. I'm going to show the same in uh, Python. All right, can you guys still see this, Zoltan? Uh, I switched. Uh... Yeah, I think so. OK, great. But guys, if you cannot see it, just uh, type it in the chat. All right, so uh, pretty much the same thing in Python. Uh, I'm just going to use uh, IPython command line. So here we import XGBoost and some other things. And then here is the same data. And then in Python, one hot encoding is a little bit more involved. Uh, and you also have to use, I really recommend to use sparse matrices here too. Again, you get like, uh, at least 10 times speed up and also memo less memory usage. Um, and these are the, uh, they are in the, basically in SciPy import sparse. So to print it, you need to transform it to a dense format. But otherwise, I have the matrices uh, sparse. And then now, uh, in Python, you have, for XGBoost, you have two APIs. One is the scikit-learn kind of API, uh, which is uh, like this. So you see, you can uh, choose the maximum depth of the tree, the number of trees, the learning rate. And actually, XGBoost, for example, is C, C++ code. So the same code is running from both R and Python. So it's going to get uh, the same results in the same time. Uh, more or less, there is some things that are specific to R Python. Uh, at the interface of the language and C, 
But once you have it in C, it's the same code. All right, and then we can also see, I'm not gonna do plots here just uh, to see the area under the curve is very similar, 0, 073. And here is like a confusion matrix. So again, uh, doing gradient boosting with R and Python is super easy. You just install this library uh, or package in R. You get the data, you do a little bit of one hot encoding, and then you train your model. It's like one line of code in Python 2 and then, uh, or I call it two lines, and then one line of code to make predictions. All right, so there is also a so-called original uh, XGBoost API. That's uh, the one that was uh, before the scikit-learn one. Uh, you can use that. Uh, it looks like this. Uh, you create these matrices. Otherwise, the scikit-learn API is creating these ma matrices behind the scene. And then uh, you, the original, the, the traditional way of running SGBoost in Python is this. Uh, it's going to give the same results. So it's whatever API you prefer. All right. Now let's go back to R. So one thing I re really recommend is uh, because uh, if you train machine learning models, they can uh, overfit. So you, if you train gradient boosting machines, too many trees is going to overfit. So you want to stop it at some point. So there is uh, all these libraries have something called early stopping. And uh, you just need to split the data uh, into a validation set that's uh, used for validation. And then to do early stopping, uh, what we're going to do, we're going to use this early stop rounds. Uh, and then you're going to pass a validation data set uh, to it, which was split. And then we're going to say to look at the evaluation matrix AUC. And basically, and then you have to use some very high uh, value for the how many trees you want because it's not going to trade that many trees. It's going to stop as soon as the AUC will uh, not increase for 10 rounds is uh, going to stop. So very easy to use uh, uh, and is going to basically stop at uh, some kind of optimal number of trees. You see here, it's going to say that the best iteration was after 221 trees. And then the rest is the same. You can uh, uh, predict. You can calculate the AUC a little bit different from uh, 100. Now, let me show you an example of what happens if we train too many trees. So I trained here 400. It's going to take a few seconds. Uh, and here I'm not stopping. I'm not using early stopping. And uh, if you look at the AUC, here you would see that uh, the AUC uh, or the accuracy increases. And then it attains some kind of maximum. And then the algorithm starts to overfit. So uh, if you keep doing more trees, you using uh, more compute power, and you're getting worse results. So uh, it's not only a waste of money or CPU time, it's also you're going to get uh, worse results. So you really want to use early stopping. Now, GPUs are a rage. So XGBoost has a GPU implementation. I'm not going to run it on 
my laptop, but uh, uh, if you have a server or desktop with a GPU card, then, then you have the driver installed. Uh, XGBoost works with in NVIDIA drivers. Uh, then uh, you can just install XGBoost. You have to compile XGBoost 2 with uh, GPU support. And then the only thing you need to change in your code is this, the three method instead of hist, which is histogram, you use GPU hist. And then it's going to do the computations of a GPU. I have to say that the GPU implementation is completely different code base than the CPU. So you're not going to get exactly the same results, exactly the same parameters. So consider it as a separate product, basically. All right, another library is LightGBM. So uh, this is also very easy to use. I can use the one hot encoding from the previous one. LightGBM also has the need of this uh, step to put the data into this highly optimized uh, data structure. And then training is also very easy, one line of code. Here is we specify the same 100 trees. Here we don't specify the depths of the trees, but how many leaves to have. So it's going to stop when it reaches this amount of leaves and the learning rate. Uh, and large GBM is super fast. Uh, and we can also make uh, predictions And the same, you can have the confusion matrix and the uh, ROC curve and uh, AUC and all that. Uh, and the last product is uh, H2O. Uh, so H2O is Java. So it's going to spin up a separate process. And then the R or the Python uh, uh, client is going to connect. So you're going to need to upload the data. And then uh, training is uh, similarly easy. It's just this one line of code. What you can say here that H2 doesn't need, you don't need to do one hot encoding. So uh, uh, it handles the categorical di data directly. So, uh, so all you need to do is read the data and uh, train and then you can score and uh, calculate the AUC. All right, I will switch back to slides now. Uh, not to this. But here, so here in the slide, you have all these things we went over in the demo. And now, uh, what I have to say is that uh, if you have tabular data, structured data for business applications, then uh, you probably want to take a look at uh, gradient boosting. Uh, if you want to be to go uh, further, learn more about gradient boosting, uh, I have a lot of repos uh, on uh, GitHub. Uh, if you don't want to read all this, then uh, I have a lot of talks on YouTube. Uh, here's one that goes into details uh, of the GBM implementations and the benchmarks a little bit. Uh, that's from last year. And uh, then, I'm going to give a talk uh, on November 10th at the LA meetup that's going to be online. Uh, and that talk will be, uh, I will go the most in depth into the benchmarks. So it will be kind of very advanced going in depth into the benchmarks and performance uh, uh, things with uh, these libraries. 
So you you are welcome to attend that event as well. So I think we can. Uh, Zoltan told me to finish by 45. It's 44. So I guess we can uh, go to questions. Feel free to ask questions. I will be here, and then uh, we'll. I heard we'll switch to Google Meet or contact me uh, through any of those channels. Thanks a lot for the great talk. And um, yeah, you are, you're on the dot on time. So I will just send it over to Elder to, to manage the Q&A, and then I'll be back with wrapping up. All right, awesome. Thanks. Yeah, uh, Sillard, so thank you very much for the great overview uh, about the GBM. And uh, what I find was very useful, uh, the very blitz overview of the tools. And I think this is something cool. And uh, I think we should do it more often. So, uh, and we had this idea to make the series called the tools. So if you guys think it's a good idea, please write it in the chat. And now um, to the questions. Um, <clears throat> so uh, we got till now 31 questions and comment. And uh, what I have noticed, um, there was like a kind of trend where people were um, doubting if um, if a GBM is the good uh, method over the others. And for example, uh, three questions that I got, for example, from Ram, uh, why boosting is called a good, good classifier. So, uh, so basically the comparison. And then the Marco asked, why does gradient boosting works better than other three based models on, spare, on sparse data sets? And Balash uh, asked the question, what is the reason that deep learning is not as good as boosting with tabular data? Yeah, I think that's an excellent question, and uh, uh, I don't really know the answer to all of that. So it seems, uh, so it, it seems somehow, uh, uh, it as I said, it depends on the data. So on uh, structure data, it seems like random forest and gradient boostings, which are both based on trees they are doing uh, pretty well and um, we don't really know why uh, they are better than deep learning so as i mentioned in the talk that i got together with some of the deep learning experts in the world uh with a guy for example who wrote mxnet and also the guy who wrote uh, h2s deep learning and gbm and we we, we tried on this data set, on the airline data set, to various archi architectures of deep learning. And uh, we simply couldn't even come close to gradient boosting. So on some other data sets, I think it's coming closer. So it kind of depends, but uh, we don't really know. But to us, it seems like, uh, it has to be with having this categorical data. So basically, the, all the structure data is kind of like a mix of uh, numeric and categorical data. And uh, the categorical data, the way deep learning in handles is that you kind of need to do this one hot encoding. And also, uh, it would use, uh, that would expand the, um, the number of features and uh, somehow trees, it seems like they are better in sorting out which category would go where in order to create those uh, predictors, which is exactly what a tree is doing. And somehow deep learning is, is more like continuous functions and it really has difficulties in dealing with this uh, basically zero one inputs and especially with uh, categorical data. So it, I think it has to do with categorical data. We don't really know. Uh, but what I can tell you that's still on Kaggle's uh, structure data problems are usually won by uh, gradient boosting and random forest. So a few years ago, when the data sets on Kaggle were smaller, then actually Random Forest was very competitive with gradient boosting. It seems like for uh, the larger data sets, 
uh, 100,000 records, a million records, gradient boosting takes over random forest. But if you have like 10,000 records, then random forest is just as good as uh, gradient boosting. Yup. And uh, we have here a question. So uh, Ariel is asking and looks like uh, she is uh, into the topic and was using the same data set. So let me, uh, I think better to read the whole question. So uh, Ariel writes um, that uh, I used exactly the same data set from the BTS for airline delay predictions. Uh, in my case, it was a regression problem, trying to predict departure delays in minutes. I got good results with XGB boost regressor, but the results were far better with a simple neural network with one hidden layer. Do you think the data is responsible here? I was expecting to get better results with uh, XG boost. Yeah, um, yeah, I, yeah, I don't really know. It's uh, perhaps it's plausible uh, because for like, uh basically for regression like neural nets they, they they provide like a more continuous kind of estimate than uh, uh gradient boosting although if you do gradient boosting with a lot of trees and uh, uh a lot of splits then it should approximate uh pretty well um yeah I, i'm not sure it also for for example for random forest i know that uh people are using completely different uh, uh hyperparameter settings for, in classification and regression so uh maybe a little bit more tweaking uh, the xgboost parameters would uh, would provide uh, better results uh i don't know you can also try to uh to predict uh, not the delay, but some kind of transform of the delay, like the log or some other function like that. I'm not sure how, uh, if there are extreme delays in the sample, but actually that would probably have more neural networks than uh, uh, XGBoost. But as I said, so I'm not, I'm not uh, religious about uh, Gradient boosting, if uh, deep learning neural nets uh, work best on some data, then uh, yeah, then use that in your project. Thanks. Uh, Gerald is asking, do you think your findings would be the same when the ratio of the categorical features are higher? Yeah, I'm, yeah, probably you refer to the cardinality is, oh, to the ratio of, um, so in this airline data set, actually in my experiments, I used, uh, may, maybe that could be also changed. So uh, I uh, uh, I changed the, so I the, man, the months, you could treat it like an ordinal value from one to 12. I actually changed it deliberately to categorical so as to mimic uh, uh, more business data where you have, more categorical. So in my experiments, the one I show in the benchmark, I actually use the this artificially made categorical. So the months were like C1 to C12 and like C8 was not, so you, you couldn't make it ordinal. I, I artificially didn't want to make it ordinal. So to resemble to kind of more business data where you usually have categories that are not ordinal. So yeah, yeah, actually it, it might change. Yep. The next question from Kagri. Um, so in case you didn't answer it because I was so into the reading the questions. Uh, Kagri is asking what are the best practices to evaluate feature importance when using uh, GBM models? Yeah, I'm, I mean, I, yeah, I'm not sure if there are really uh, best practices so I think the question, yeah, the question might refer to two things. One is for feature selection and the other one, uh, and then drop some of the features. And then the other thing would be uh, once you created a model and you want to 
see more inside the model and which features are more important. So, uh, so random forest and gradient boosting has this kind of classical uh, feature importance that you have with all the tree ensembles, which uh, uh, is described in, in many of these books. So it, it basically it's look at the splits and it looks like each split in all those few hundred trees and few hundred splits in each. And then uh, it looks how much it improves uh, 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 with each split. And basically it assigns the importance based on that. But I, I think lately I really like better to look at so-called Shapley values so uh, Shapley values are used, are pushed by the un interpretable machine uh, learning crowds, but I, I think they are very good for this kind of model debugging. So Shapley values are a way to decompose your function uh, into components for each variable. And basically a higher Shapley value would say, say for the variable X7, would mean that X7 is more important in making that prediction. And it's, uh, it's basically for every data point, uh, you can calculate this Shapley values and then you can create some kind of, can create some kind of variable importance based on the uh, mean absolute Shapley value because the Shapley value can be positive or negative depending on if it increases the prediction function or it decreases. Uh, so uh, look at Shapley values, S-H-A-P-L-E-Y. Uh, just Google that and uh, um, you will find some resources to read on. So I think they are very, and, and also put maybe model debugging. And then, then you would probably get into uh, my friend Patrick Hall's uh, blog post and uh, IPython notebooks, which is, are really great. And uh, the last question uh, from Yaroslav. So I'm sorry, guys, that I couldn't answer uh, to, to, to state all the questions, but uh, we will have uh, such a chance. So uh, stay with us. So the question from Yaroslav, is GBM applicable to a small data sets uh, when we are talking about hundreds or thousands? Uh, of observations. Yeah, for hundreds of thousand, yeah, no problem. Uh, actually, the demo was on a hundred thousand data set. You can see that you you can feed it. No, I, like, I, th I thought it was about like hundreds. Oh, thousands. hundreds. And thousands, like separate. Yeah, I mean, uh, I usually say no. I would use uh, linear models because uh, otherwise you would probably overfit. I have a friend who was arguing with me that he's been using GBMs also on like a hundred or a few hundred observations. But to me, it seems like, yeah, you have to be very careful with overfitting. So you would have to have enough test data to to evaluate or or if you deploy it in production, then, then uh, test it very carefully because uh, if you use GBMs, uh, they are very flexible and then very complex. And then uh, my guess is on 100 data points, uh, it, it will overfit. You can, uh, you can try to reduce the overfitting, like uh, train only a few trees, reduce the depths of the trees. And uh, this, this way you can uh, control the overfitting. So uh basically i think yeah a better answer like is like kind of my standard answer it depends so just or it, try it out uh but be careful because of overfitting uh, otherwise just use uh, some simple linear models so uh then guys thank you very much for your questions and i would like to give a pass uh, to pass the ball to sultan back and uh right now will be an interesting moment the the, the prize for the best questions uh, for the best question. Sultan, are you here? Yes, ah. absolutely, I'm here. Well, it would so. be cool if you can turn on your camera so uh, we can see, so those who will not join the close-up can see you, if it's possible. See that, that's, that's for you. Uh, yeah, just, um, I think my internet slowed down. I need to reload, hold on, and then I... Uh... But that's fine, it's better to stay. Yeah. We can <laughs> hear, because we can hear really well. 
So, yeah. Okay, so Sila is rejoining. All right. Yeah, uh, good. Yeah. Yeah, it's just a little bit flaky, but I think it's a better than uh, better than not seeing anything. Right. So, Silar, what? Uh, which questions uh, did you like the lot? Yeah, I think uh, I really most? like the first question, but that was kind of like uh, asked by three people. Three people. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> hard stuff, Adar. Hard stuff. How much? How much is the book cost? <laughs> 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 no, I mean, guys. Okay, no, I, I don't think it's very expensive. So I can talk with uh, our supporters with SAS, and uh, we can organize uh, three books if they are not too expensive. Yeah, it's twenty euros. Uh, so right, okay, then that's fine. So like, uh, I would like then to tell the names. These were um, Ram, and he was quite active today. Marco and Balash. So uh, drop us uh, in the chat your uh, email. 